O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful, and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Now let us rise to sing our opening hymn, For All the Saints. glorious God in heaven, our loving Father, we praise thee and thank thee once again that we can worship thee on this, the Lord's day, the day when Jesus rose from the dead after he was crucified. And how we thank thee, O Lord, that week by week, Sunday by Sunday, we are reminded of this truth, 
the gospel truth of salvation and how we are thy blood-bought children. We thank thee so much that the blood of the Lord Jesus shed 2,000 years ago is still very powerful to save and to wash us and cleanse us from all our sins. And Father, we come humbly before thee once more to seek the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we who have backslided or strayed away from thee, we who have not obeyed thy word enough, we have fallen short of thy glory. Please lift us up. Restore us unto thyself. We confess, O oh Lord, before thee our weaknesses, our failings, our iniquities, our transgressions. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that thou art plenteous in mercy and how thou art ever ready to forgive and to restore us unto thyself. Great is thy love for us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we may love thee as much. Now, O oh Lord, we need more and more of our faith, especially in these very, very trying and difficult times, to continue to believe in the Lord Jesus and to trust in him always. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that thy spirit continues to indwell us, to keep us, preserve us, protect us, even until the day of redemption. We thank thee, O Lord, for this blessed hope we have in thee, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that truly we are saints, sanctified ones, washed and cleansed by the Lord Jesus, by his blood, and by his word. So we thank thee, we who are the saints of God, born again, do adore thee and worship thee. So, Lord, come down to be present with us this morning, this day, that we might have good fellowship with thee as we worship thee in spirit and in truth. And may thou also, by thy word, teach us many things concerning thyself. For all this we ask and pray in the blessed name of Christ our Saviour, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it's now. For our scriptural reading, let us turn to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. Psalm 42 to the chief musician, Maskil, for the sons of Korah. Verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude, I went with them to the house of God, with a voice of 
joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mitzah. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto, unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. For well, they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. The Lord bless the reading of his most comforting word. And now let us sing the psalm. Psalm 42. This is the fourth Sunday. We are worshipping away from the RELC in a corporate manner. And I hope you are longing to come back together again so that we might worship together physically with one another in a corporate way. So we pray the Lord will allow us to do that soon, and that this crisis will be over soon. So in the meantime, let us keep in touch by checking for news and updates uh, through uh, Telegram and through our church website. And if you need counsel and prayer, please feel free, do not hesitate, to call me, my telephone number is in the weekly, 
and you can call me anytime. So make sure you download the weekly and read the weekly. There are many good articles and testimonies. And uh, recently, we have uh, wonderful testimonies of those who have just been baptized and those who have transferred their membership to our church. So please read those testimonies and in time get to know these new members in the church. And now let us return thanks to the Lord by worshipping the Lord with our tithe and our offerings and we shall sing the hymn, Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, a life that is true.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Our Father in heaven, we thank Thee that Thou art a God who hears and answers prayers. And so right now we want to pray unto Thee and plead with Thee that Thou would be merciful upon this nation, this island state of Singapore in which we live. Now we thank Thee and praise Thee for Thy goodness to those of us here in this land, for You have blessed us with much peace and prosperity for so many decades since independence. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we will always be mindful and thankful that Thou hast been so merciful and gracious to us. To know that all that we have gained, the resources we have, we who are Thy children should make use of the things we have to extend thy kingdom, to glorify thy name, to fulfill thy holy purpose for us while we are still here on earth, to serve thee until the Lord Jesus comes. And how we pray for those who rule over us, our government leaders, that thou at this time would bless them with much wisdom to deal with this COVID crisis that we are now going through. And how, O oh Lord, it is such an infectious and such a widespread disease. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will help our government and all Singaporeans to do their best to contain the spread. And now, O oh Lord, we pray for all the foreign workers in dormitories, especially who have fallen ill. Many have been infected. Father, we pray for each one of them, that you will help them to recover. We pray for all those working in the hospital, in the clinics, the frontline staff, our medical team, doctors and nurses, and all involved in this work, that you will grant them a double portion of thy grace, that you will, O oh Lord, bless them with the health and the strength to help people overcome this sickness, that none, O oh Lord, will, will be lost. All will recover. This is our prayer. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that the death toll here in Singapore is very low. Father, we pray you will stem this death tide. And we pray, O oh Lord, that the numbers will decrease. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that those who have been infected locally, the numbers have come down. We pray, O oh Lord, that the spread will be contained so that, O oh Lord, in good time, in due time, we can be restored to normalcy and we can return to thy house to worship thee. So, Lord, this is our prayer. So, please keep all of us in both church and college free from infection. For those who are not well in body, who are suffering from ill health in one way or other, we pray thy healing hand also be upon them to heal them and also help us in such a time to really look forward to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that is to come, where there is perfection and purity and all things good. 
So Lord, help us to live for Thee even at this time, to be a good witness and testimony for Thee. We pray, O oh Lord, that You will continue to provide for our needs, both physically and spiritually at this time. And we pray also for FEBC students who will be embarking on their examinations very soon. So help us, O oh Lord, each one of us, keep us, sustain us, watch over us. We need Thee to help us in our time of need. And again, now when we open Thy Word to learn from Thy truth, we pray Thy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Teach us Thy way. All this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For our text, let us turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. And this verse is a familiar verse, a verse I trust most of us, if not all of us, have memorized. Philippians 1 verse 21. It says here, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And I've restated it this way. Live or die, we win. Live or die, we win. We are winners in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the world is right now in a lockdown. More than half the world is in a lockdown. And why? It's because of this coronavirus, which is potentially deadly. And already a lot have died. Thousands by the day. And we have seen mass burial grounds or graves. It's a very, very sorry sight. And this lockdown is necessary to contain the spread because people do not want to die. People are afraid to die. And for those in the world, to live is gain. To die is loss. To die is loss. That's why they don't want to die. That's why they are afraid to die. Because they will lose a whole lot. But for us as believers, for us as Christians, it is quite different. As Paul here says, For to me to live, he says, is Christ. To live is Christ, and to die, uh, it is not loss. For us, it is gain. For, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, how can we say that? How can we say to die is gain? How do we gain by dying? How do we gain in death? That is a wonderful thing about our God and our Savior, who gives us such a wonderful philosophy of life. We know how to live, and we know also how to die, and why we die. And when we die, it is not loss, it is gain. Live or die, we win. Now, how can we say this? We can say this because of these two reasons, right? Two reasons here. And the first is this. First reason we can say to die is gain is because we have the assurance of salvation. We have the assurance of salvation. In other words, we know where we are going. 
And this we learn from verse 19 to verse 21. And here Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And he says also, in the context, you look back at verse 19, he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul is sure of his salvation. Paul knows where he is going when he dies. And right now, he may just be facing death because he is not in a good place right now. He's not in a pleasant situation. Where was Paul right now when he wrote these words? He was in prison. And if you read again earlier in the context, you go back to verse 7, Paul says here, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. So here Paul says he is in chains. Right? He talks about his bonds. He's now imprisoned, not for any crime that he had committed. He was imprisoned not for any crime, but for Christ, for preaching the gospel of Christ. He is now imprisoned, waiting for trial. And it is possible that he could face death or execution at any moment, at any time. And even in such a difficult time, where he may lose his, his life at any moment, he did not complain. He was not troubled. He was not upset. In fact, he was full of joy and peace. And he says, I'm not ashamed of where I am now and what I'm doing. I'm not afraid even in such a dangerous and such a deadly situation. And it's because Paul was very sure, very sure of his God, very sure of the, of the gospel that he is preaching, very sure of his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this we read in, in another epistle of his in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Now in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, we, we find Paul saying, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So here Paul says, I don't mind going through all this suffering for the sake of Christ. And why? Because I know, I know very deeply, I know very, very truly whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He was sure of his salvation. He was sure of where he was going after he dies. And of course, it is back home to his heavenly Father, to his Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God who has made this promise that whosoever believeth in the Lord Jesus shall never perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. That promise is good and will hold true no matter what. And surely God will keep his word. Surely we will get there if we are children of God 
and disciples of the Lord Jesus, born again, justified, sanctified, we will ultimately be glorified. So Paul, Paul's you know, feelings and, and Paul's uh, thoughts, Paul's life was not determined by circumstances, but by conviction. The external circumstances, whether good or bad, does not affect how he, he lives. The way he lives is controlled by his personal conviction, which is from within. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded, fully persuaded, convinced, convicted by this fact and this truth, the gospel truth, that I belong to God. I belong to my Savior, and my life is saved in the arms of Jesus, in his hands. And so for me, for to me to live, it's Christ. And to die is gain. And he can say this with all certainty and with full assurance. Do you have such certainty and assurance? You know, recently, my dear wife was diagnosed with lung cancer, third stage lung cancer. Of course, this came as a shock to us because when it is lung cancer, as they say, it is the death sentence because the survival rate of lung cancer patients and victims are very low. It's a death sentence. And that was not the only shock. There was another one that came after the biopsy. And it was diagnosed that her form of lung cancer was of a very rare type. Our doctor, who is a senior consultant and a professor of oncology and head of his department, he says, this is the first time I've come across such a case. So it was a double shock. A death sentence, so to speak. But my wife, was quick to say, our lives are in the hands of God. And of course, he is in control. He knows everything. Even the number of hairs on our head, he knows. And our life is his. It belongs to him. He can give it, and he can take it away. We just keep trusting in the Lord. Of course, when these news came to us, what came to my mind was this verse. What Paul here says in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so it is not a death sentence for us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a life sentence, not a death sentence an eternal life sentence, because when death comes, it's life forevermore. Death is only a door towards life eternal. And we are sure of this, and we are fully persuaded of this. And so this bad circumstance may be a shock but there's a greater comfort that comes from the good news of the Lord Jesus. And we are convinced and convicted 
of this truth, that Jesus has loved us and saved us, and we will forever be with him, whether in life or in death. Live or die, we win. So to the world, it may be a death sentence, but for us who are believers, it's a life sentence. And that's why Paul here can say, to die is gain. It's not lost. To die is gain. What does it mean here, to die is gain? Paul says, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. To die is gain. To die means more of the Lord Jesus Christ. If to live is Christ, to die is more Christ. Because now you see him face to face. Now you have personal fellowship and communion with him. Now you're in heaven. And now you will have your glorified and your resurrected body. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. All things passed away, all things have are become new in the Lord Jesus. And that's what death will bring a whole lot of gain because of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's more of Christ. So to live is Christ. To die is gain. It is more Christ. And don't we, we want to have more of him, more of the Lord Jesus? I'm sure we want more of the Lord Jesus. He who has loved us so much and gave his all for us. I think we should long and desire for him to be with him. So, are you afraid to die? Make sure you know the Lord Jesus Christ then you will not be afraid. And perfect love will cast out all fear. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You must have, you must have faith in, in the Lord Jesus. Great faith. And then you will not be afraid. You must know him fully and truly and deeply. Then you will know how to live for Christ. And you know how to die too. And how to die is great gain. For it is all about him, all about Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. He is our victory. Live or die, we win because of Christ. And so we are not afraid of death because when we die, it is not hell but heaven, which is so much better. So here Paul is not sad or sorrowful at all. In fact, he is very joyful and very glad to be in this uh, state, in this position, although in prison, uh, he is so thankful to the Lord and also joyful because good things come out of his life in prison. For to me to live is Christ. So as I live, I must bear witness and testify for Christ. And even though he was in prison, that did not stop him from preaching or sharing the gospel with those around him. In fact, he was so happy that now he was in prison, he could reach out to the people in Caesar's palace, that through his bonds, a good many got saved. 
And we read this, right? Early on, you look at verse 12. Paul here says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel has made inroads even into the heart of the Roman Empire. Not just the city of Rome, but even into Caesar's palace, his household. So that in my bonds, verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident in my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So here he says, two things have happened. Unbelievers have become believers, and they are those in the palace, right? In the palace. Caesar's household, especially the praetorium guards, the imperial guards of Caesar right now, who were watching over Paul, keeping watch over him. And as they kept watch over Paul, Paul will be preaching to them the gospel of Christ. And the Holy Spirit was working mightily. And many, Paul here says, have become converted because the gospel has, yes, indeed, been furthered, has gone into and is manifest in all the palace. So this, this uh, conversion of souls in, in the palace have been widespread, right? It's manifest in all the palace and all other places. So Paul rejoiced that in his incarceration, salvation has come to many in Caesar's palace. And others, believers outside, have become very courageous to preach the gospel also. They have not become afraid because of Paul's imprisonment, they have become even more bold in sharing the gospel openly and publicly, to speak the word without fear. So good things have come out of this bad situation. And this also has been the case, I'm thankful to say, that my wife's cancer and through a testimony as one young, young man who has been rebellious against the truth, against the gospel, has repented, has caused him to take stock of life. The thing that to know that life is not in his hands, he's accountable to his creator who desires to be his savior and he has repented and believed on the Lord and has found salvation. So something good has come out of this. For this we are thankful and grateful to the Lord that in our weakness, some have found strength and to believe in the Lord Jesus and live for him. That's what here Paul means when he says, for me, for to me to live is Christ. It's Christ. To bear witness for him, to live for the Lord. And then to die is gain. Well, it's more of Christ. Now to worship him in his very presence, to serve him even in heaven itself to enjoy great fellowship with the Lord Jesus and with the heavenly company that's already there. So what great salvation God has wrought for us. And Paul was sure of this. He knows for sure where he's going. So that's the first reason why 
We say we win, whether in life or in death. Live or die, we win because we know for sure where we are going. We have the assurance of salvation. A second reason we find here is from verse 22 to 26, which is the privilege of service. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, we live, for us to live is Christ because we live to serve him. We live not to serve self, not for selfish reasons that we live. We live because we want to serve and glorify our Lord and Savior. So that's what it means here. For to me, to live is Christ. It's to be of service to him, to the Lord, and to one another. And that's why in verse 22, Paul here says, But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. So Paul here says, as long as I have life, as long as I'm still living in the flesh in this world, I must live for the Lord Jesus. I must be a fruitful Christian. I must bear fruit for him. And I must work hard for him. The fruit of my labor. So how we are very thankful that we have this privilege to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And while we are here on earth, uh, we are in his majesty's service, right? And no better, no better person, no better one to serve than to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's such a good Lord, a good master. He never fails, although sometimes we fail him, yet he never fails. And he will continue to teach us and guide us and train us and mold us so that we become better and better servants for him. Well, this is the kind of God that we have. What a privilege to serve him. That's why Paul here says, if I live in the flesh, uh, this is the fruit of my labor. I will work for the Lord. But here Paul also is very honest to say that actually he prefers to depart. Right? He, said, he goes on to say, Yet what I shall choose, I, I wot not. For I am in a strait, verse 23, I am in a strait, I am in a, in a bind betwixt two, between this two. Having a desire to depart, that is to go to heaven, and to be with Christ, which is far better, he says. Of course it is. And then he says in verse 24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So here Paul says, really he desires to depart. He desires to die. He desires for more of the Lord Jesus. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. I want that gain. To depart. To be with Christ, he says, is far better. But Paul also was not selfish. He was selfless. Although it's more difficult, painful, trying to remain on earth, he says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He was thinking of others. More needful for you. Because he wants to serve them. Not only to serve the Lord, he wants to serve others, to serve God's people. To continue to preach to them and teach them God's word so that their faith might increase. They might experience more joy in their life and might have the wisdom to know how to live for the Lord Jesus. 
And in verse 25, we read him saying, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, with you all for your furtherance and joy of the faith. He wants to further, to further their joy of faith. Which was very needful because the Christians in those days were living in very, very difficult and trying times. A whole lot of persecution and poverty. And how they need the word of God to sustain them, to keep them to help them in their time of need, to grant them the wisdom to know what to do, to strengthen them in times of danger and crisis, that they may continue to bear a good witness for the Lord. And so although it is, it is better to depart, I think all of us prefer to do that, to go and be with the Lord right now. Yet, I think there is still much work to be done. More for us to do in the service and ministry of the Lord. And so we pray for life. Anyway, you know, eternal life is eternal. It is without end. A long, long, long time. Our time in this flesh, in this world, is actually a very short time. So we ought to live as much as we can, as long as we can, as long as the Lord will have us, right? Live for Him right here on earth. Although there may be a lot of pain and suffering and hardship, well, let us desire to live for the Lord right now, to serve Him, to make Him known, and to build up his saints and to build up his church, to serve others. And that's a needful thing to do right now. And so although my wife now is fighting cancer, uh, her life is in God's hand and we are praying, we are praying for life. Lord, that you may give her more life to live right now, not for not for selfish reasons, but that she may have more years, more time to serve Him, to serve the Lord. That's our prayer, that God's healing hand might be upon her, might also be upon me. The Lord will grant me the health and strength and much grace to serve Him even until the day the Lord returns. And this should be our desire as well although we desire very much to depart, but we should also desire to remain when we see there is a need to do so. So pray with us, will you? And may the Lord be gracious and merciful to grant us life. And, and here we know that Paul you know, Paul was quite confident that he would be released. You know, our God's a God who hears and answers prayers. And the church, the saints, have been praying for the Apostle Paul, that he might be released. And we read of this as uh, in verse 19, didn't we? In verse 19, we read, For I know, Paul says, I know that this shall turn, this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So the church has been praying for him. And Paul was quite, quite confident that he will not be kept in prison for long, that he will be released. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation, my deliverance, my release from prison. And so in verse 25, he says, I, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. That means he will continue to live and remain and continue with you. Continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So he says, 
I'm going to be released soon and I'm going to see you. I'm coming to you again to minister to you, to teach you the scriptures, to encourage you in your faith. So the Lord has heard the prayers of his saints that Paul should be released. They must be praying, Lord, we still need Paul to minister to us, to teach us. Please let him live. Please release him that he might come to teach us more of thy word. And the Lord heard that prayer. And the Lord answered that prayer. And Paul here, the, the Lord must have revealed to him, Paul, you will continue to abide and remain. You will continue to live. I want you to live because my people still need my word. And you must continue to preach and to teach, to teach them my word, to further their faith. And then in verse 27, we read, only let your conversation, Paul here says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So let your conversation, let your manner of life, your conduct be fitting of someone who names the name of Christ, who's a believer of the gospel of Christ, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Whether I'm present or whether I'm absent, that you will be living your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, He is your God and your Savior. Ultimately, it's all about Him for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, and that must be the case for you as well. It's not about me. I'm just an instrument, God's agent and servant to help you in your faith. But ultimately, the Lord is the one who controls all things. And we owe everything to Him. To worship Him, to serve Him, to glorify Him, and to live for Him. So let your conversation, your way of life, your manner of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That ye stand fast in one spirit and one mind, united in heart and in doctrine, striving together for the faith of the gospel, confessing and testifying of the Lord Jesus all the time. And there's been four Sundays already we have been away. Although you see me on the screen, and not personally or physically, and I can't see you. You know, I long for the day when we can gather back together and see one another in the flesh. Do you long for that time that we can come back together as a church? I pray you do. I, I, I do. I long for that day. I want to see you again. I want to see you well in the Lord. Even right now, when I don't see you, I pray you are spiritually well in the Lord. You are drawing closer and closer to Him. Although we don't have the kind of church communion and fellowship we used to have, we are now far apart and far away. We are now you know, keeping our distance from one another. We cannot be near to one another to provoke one another in the love and the good works and to encourage one another in a very personal way. Yet, Paul here says, even in my absence, I pray your, your life be one that is pleasing unto the Lord. Live for Him. So let us live for the Lord. You know, in this uh, COVID crisis right now, how can we live for the Lord? How can we testify for Him as Christians? Well, I think we 
can live in this way. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. I think we can, we can live a life that is befitting of the gospel of Christ by not being kiasu, being scared to lose or be, to be afraid to lose. Don't be kiasu. Why? Because live or die, we win. Right? So we are not afraid to die. We don't have the kiasu spirit which is not befitting of the gospel. Live or die, we win. We are not kiasu, we are also not kiasi. We are not afraid to lose and we are not afraid to die. For to die is gain, Paul says, to die is gain. So let us live in such a way with full confidence in our Lord and Savior and not fearful of death at all. Life and death is in the hands of our heavenly Father. And it's not time for us to go. We will not go. Right? But it's time for us to go. No matter what we do, we cannot stop it. Anyway, for me to live, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To die is more Christ. Live or die, we win. We do not lose. We gain a, a great deal and a whole lot. To live already is, is good because we have the Lord. To die is better. We have more of Him. So that's how we should live right now. And yes, there may be a lot of sufferings, hardships, difficulties at this time, but we can draw grace and strength from the Lord. And so in verse 29 we read, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer, to suffer, for his sake. So yes, our life here on earth may be full of suffering, may come now and then, the Lord may allow it, right, right now I think a lot of us are suffering, and maybe more suffering to come in the future, but let us take heart, take courage, that for unto you is God's will, right? It's God's will for us to suffer for the Lord Jesus. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So to live as Christ. To live as Christ means, well, part of living for Christ is to suffer for the Lord Jesus. Deny self, take up our own cross, follow him. For to me, to live is Christ means just that. Involves suffering. And to die is gain. No more suffering, right? Uh, we have our glorified, resurrected body just like the Lord. Just like the body the Lord has. And now we look forward to that as well. So we now live for the cross, right? We have to bear our own crosses. And then when we die, uh, we will gain the crown. We will gain the crown. That is the way of Christ. Christ bore the cross, and now he's crowned. And we are to follow in that way. Uh, we bear our crosses, and when we get there, to die is gain. We will gain the crown that the Lord has prepared for us. So let us live for the Lord. So live or die. In the, Lord Jesus Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ, live or die, we win. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Me, the Lord, help us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this good philosophy of life that comes from thy word. Help us, O Lord, to take this 
word to heart, our heart will be strengthened and will be emboldened to live for thee even in such difficult and dangerous times. That we will be a people not afraid to lose, for in thee there is much to gain. People who are not afraid to die because to die is gain. For me, to live is Christ. To die is gain, indeed. So what a blessed people we are in the Lord Jesus. And what a blessed God thou art to all of us. So bless us, we pray. For all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, let us sing this hymn. For me to live is Christ, and to die is King. Now may the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you until Jesus comes again. Amen.